Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Dan Griswold. Dan is a research fellow and co-director of the Trade and Immigration Project at the Mercatus Center. He is a nationally recognized expert on trade and immigration policy and is a previous guest on Macro Musings. Dan joins us today to get us up to speed on the latest developments and issues on the ever-expanding U.S. trade war with the rest of the world. Dan, welcome back to the show. Hi, David. Great to have you, Juan. And man, does this trade war seem to be growing. And there's so much going on. I'm glad to have you here. We're going to try to air this show as soon as we can because things happen so fast in your area here of trade that this can be quickly become obsolete. I want to read an introduction by Felix Salmon, and he had a newsletter. He touched on this war, and it's kind of a broad picture, but it kind of paints the backdrop of how broad the war is becoming, and then I want you to maybe comment on it. And it speaks to the escalation. And so this is what he says, and we may not agree with everything he says, but this is how he frames it. He goes, the U.S. is in the middle of a full-blown trade war with China, our largest source of imports. There's broad bipartisan consensus that even if the Trump administration's tactics are misguided, China achieved its dominant trade position unscrupulously being selective as to which international trade norms it would accept. America's largest backup source of imports is Mexico, a member in good standing of NAFTA since inception. A natural part of any U.S. trade war with China would normally consist of encouraging American companies to source their products through Mexico as a backup to China. And the White House is in a hurry to ratify the USMCA, which is the successor agreement to NAFTA. In six months, the U.S. could find itself fighting another big trade battle, this time with the EU and Japan. In just over a month, the U.S. plans to end India's preferential trade privileges. Trump also wanted to impose tariffs on Australia. So what I've just painted there is a picture of multiple fronts in a yes. war. And what he, what this author goes on to say is this is like the worst possible time to start another trade war with one of our best allies, Mexico. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, there's never a good time to start a trade war. Just just a little uh, background, you know, to use the war metaphor, the first shot was fired, I'd argue, in January of 2018. So 2018, 2017 was a quiet year for trade. Uh, the Trump administration was working on tax reform and, and other things. In January of 2018, the administration imposed duties on imported washing machines and solar panels under a section of the trade law called Section 201. And I would argue we didn't need those tariffs, but they were relatively small, and there's some lessons to be learned from there. Then in March of 2018, uh, the Trump administration imposed duties on imported steel. They first started with certain countries and then threatened to expand them to our major trading partners in June of that year. And if you remember, uh, Gary Cohen, who used to be the president's chief economic advisor, he resigned over yeah. those steel tariffs. He was like the last, I would say, a sane voice on trade in, in the White House. And once he left, tariff man was unleashed. <laughs> um, the, the duties on steel uh, went up to the full 25% in June on most of our steel imports, including from Mexico and Canada. And then we started actions against China uh, that summer. Uh, first, 25% uh, duties on $50 billion of imports from China based on these uh, complaints against China's economic policies. And I'd quibble with the, your opening quote there from that writer. Uh, I think China has largely achieved its position because of market reforms and comparative advantage in a lot of uh, uh, sectors. And then uh, the China actions just continued to escalate, right? Uh, into the fall, it expanded. The Chinese retaliated predictably. And then the president said, well, we're going to put tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. First 10% in the fall. They've recently gone up to the full 25%. So basically, uh, we have 25% duties on $250 billion of imports uh, from China. Uh, the president has threatened uh, 
to put a 25% tariff on the rest of the 300 billion or so we import from China. And now we're getting close to up to date. The one piece of good news in all this, David, is that the president decided uh, to draw back and eliminate the tariffs on imported steel from Canada and Mexico. One, there's absolutely no national security issue there, uh, but he also needed to set a good tone for the uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which is the NAFTA replacement uh, or upgrading that the president's negotiated. Two weeks later, after we had this kind of breakthrough with Canada and Mexico, the president announces by how else by tweet uh, that he's going to start imposing these escalating tariffs on Mexico, not over any trade issue, uh, but over immigration uh, at the border. So that kind of brings us where we're at. You're right. There's other issues uh, looming in the future. This threat against uh, Australia, Um, the president in a few months is going to decide whether to impose duties on imported cars as a, get this, a national security threat. You know, importing a Mercedes-Benz or a Lexus from Japan is somehow a threat to national security. So it could get worse before it gets better, but we're in a pretty uh, bad spot right now. and We're in a spot we haven't been for decades in terms of tariffs here in the United States. Yeah, and, you know, one thing that strikes me about this is how much support he's received. And we'll talk about a little bit in in a little bit about how he has gotten some pushback on Mexico from Republican senators. Ted Cruz, for example, in Texas. But in general, he's received a lot of support from his party, which is surprising to me. If you go back and look at Ronald Reagan and look at Republicans in the past, they were very different about trade. And this has probably been the most surprising change I've seen. You know, I consider myself right of center, you know, very sympathetic to I, I love Ronald Reagan. I'll, I'll confess, I like Ronald Reagan what, me, and his views on me trade. Me too, and he's looking better all the time. Yeah, and it's just, it's just, I'm shocked how far we've come from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump when it comes to views on trade. Yes, well, it's it's complicated. Uh, first, China. China's a very unsympathetic foreign character, right? Their government is uh, uh, oppressive of the people. They do violate uh, a lot of norms of international. Uh, commerce. And and I would basically agree that there we have some real issues with China having to do with intellectual property, how they treat foreign investment, and then, of course, the whole geostrategic thing about the South China Sea and Taiwan. And we've got some real issues with China. They are not a friend the way Mexico and Canada and Europe and Japan right. uh, are. But uh, tariffs are not the right approach there. Uh, and so that's where I would diverge from a lot of the China hawks on how we go about best remedying that and happy to talk about that in a moment. But then, of course, politics. Uh, Republicans are uh, hesitant to challenge their their leader, the, the, their, their man in the White House. And that's been disappointing. One, on economic grounds, and you're right, Republicans, they used to be the protectionist party, you know, back in the days of Herbert Hoover, they became the more pro-free trade party in recent decades, led by Reagan and others. So Republicans should oppose the tariffs on economic grounds, but then you get the the politics mixed in. They're just hesitant to challenge uh, their leader. One other good reason to challenge the president on tariffs is constitutional grounds. Congress should be protective of its turf. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution is very clear. It is Congress and Congress alone that has the authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations and to impose duties on imports. And this pre- Congress has given presidents limited authority over that. This president has rammed through those limits uh, with a high-speed truck and totally <laughs> abused uh, the trade law. It's an awful crash scene he le- leaves behind. <laughs> Big mess in his wake. You know, we've had Doug Irwin on the show, great economic historian, trade historian. One of the interesting things I learned from him in his book that we talked about is how both parties used to support trade. And one of the big motivations was foreign policy. We're fighting communism. Um, it was West versus the East. And, and it all kind of comes to an end when, when the, you know, the Berlin Wall falls and communism collapse. And soon after that, you see the Democrats start to be very more critical of trade policy. So like getting NAFTA passed, Republicans were still 
free trade, Democrats begin to question it, although it was you know, Bill Clinton that, that actually helped finally push it through. But you, you see the cracks emerge, I guess, yes. after that period. And now we're seeing even more cracks emerge in kind of the last you know, few free trade um, politicians out there. Yeah, D- David, I agree with that. And there, there were cracks showing in the 70s, I think, okay. uh, the, the movement of organized labor. Organized labor used to tentatively support trade liberalization back in Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson years. They started to become more skeptical in the 70s and the 80s. And of course, they're a cons- key constituency of the Democratic Party. So you started to see some of this break. Uh, and yes, it accelerated in the 90s. NAFTA, 40% of House Democrats voted for NAFTA. So there was still, that was a bipartisan uh, agreement. Uh, but you're right, it became more partisan. The irony today is President Trump, of course, has, has scrambled that, hasn't he? He's the, he's the protectionist in chief uh, and a Republican. And what you're seeing in terms of uh, pub- public support is actually the public support for free trade is at something of a high, but the composition has changed. Republican rank and file Republicans are becoming more skeptical of trade. They think, well, Trump is saying it's there's something wrong with it. There must be something to that. Democrats are swinging more in favor of trade. So the politics of trade have become more complicated than ever. More disappointing than ever. <laughs> But in any event, you know, we, we need to move on and, and talk about some of the actual more recent developments. And let's talk about China. You've touched yes. on already. Um, you, you mentioned that there's an additional $300 billion that could have additional tariffs. So it takes us close to or over $500 billion if it yeah. were to be passed. Vir- virtually every, every good that we import from China could be subject to a 25% tariff by later later this year. Yeah, the administration – uh, uh, the U.S. trade representative, Robert Lighthizer, he's a chi- longtime China hawk. Uh, they produced a Section 301 report on China, which had a lot of good factual information in it. It cataloged the various ways that Chinese actors violate intellectual property. Uh, China restricts uh, foreign investment in China. Uh, and so kind of the the indictment had a lot of truth to it. Um, where I think the administration has gotten off track is when they tend to exaggerate uh, the impact. They they minimize the gains that we enjoy from trade with China, and they are substantial for tens of millions of, of Americans. And they've exaggerated the costs. And then, of course, the response of these escalating tariffs are all out of proportion to anything China has done. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The Trump administration's tariffs are doing more damage to the U.S. economy than anything uh, China has done. Yeah, so there's also effects happening in China that we may not like, not just cost to the U.S. economy, but but cost to how China's being operated, who it interacts with. I was reading the Wall Street Journal today how Chinese and and Russian officials are now getting closer together because of all the trade noise and confusion that we're creating. I don't think that was an intended consequence, but that's something we're getting. And also, you know, we lose the moral authority when we start playing like this, and it allows China to be more, you know, uh, um, random and and capricious in how it deals with trade issues. Yes. You know, uh, free traders like me will argue on economic grounds that trade is the right thing to do. But but I think there's also a historical argument that trade has a has a moderating influence. You know, we talked about the turn to free trade in the post-war era to bring the uh, Western uh, countries closer together, and and that's been true. You don't want to oversell that, though. Uh, expanding trade relations don't guarantee uh, necessarily better relations between countries or more uh, liberal policies in internally, and we're seeing that in in China and and. It is uh, the dynamics of the Chinese one-party state and President Xi. They've they've tended to move away from reform. I think the president's tariff war is pushing China in exactly the wrong direction. It's kind of put them in a corner. It's aroused uh, nationalism in China, and uh, you're you're seeing China starting to push back. Both retaliation, uh, they're threatening to withhold uh, exports of certain uh, key minerals called rare earths. And uh, it's making harder, making it harder for us to work with China on mutual uh, issues of of security, and that's why we may be 
pushing them closer to to Russia and making it harder to to work with them on these other issues. Yeah, I was just reading another article from Bloomberg recently about how Boeing has a huge mega deal with um, China, where it's working on a big, big deal with China for a uh, four hundred forty-two million dollars sticker price. They're going to sell a bunch of their their big seven 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 planes to an airliner over there, and you know the, the sell is going to be contingent upon how these this trade war <laughs> ends yes. up. So that's a lot of jobs in the U.S. I mean, it, it yes. affects. I mean, you mentioned it affects us in terms of our economy, but how they interact with us is going to get more hostile if we're not careful. Well, that that's right, and it just points out uh, that trade is a two-way street. You know, uh, President Trump's uh, chief trade advisor, Peter Navarro, who's not a trade economist, uh, doesn't know much about trade, and he gives the president all the wrong advice. He said uh, earlier this year that no country would retaliate against the United States because our market's too lucrative. Uh, that turned out to be exactly wrong. Uh, Mexico and Canada retaliated on the steel tariffs. China has retaliated. You know, China is is our number one source of imports to the United States. I don't see anything wrong with that. We get useful products that make our lives better uh, every, every day, but they're a major export. They're the third largest uh, export market for U.S. exports. You mentioned Boeing's. Boeing, we actually sell them a lot of cars. Uh, all sorts of uh, uh, industrial components. The and farmers, machinery. right? The farmers. Uh, up yeah. until recently, China was uh, close to being our major market for U.S. farm exports, $20 billion or more a year, uh, poultry, pork, soybeans, uh, all, all sorts of things. That's in jeopardy. And an interesting thing, it isn't – we have a uh, – China has a large tr- bilateral trade surplus, so we have a lot more – imports to target than China does in the tariff war. But we have a large surplus in services trade with China. Have you noticed the other day, China is warning its citizens not to travel to the United States. They're saying because of gun violence and things like that. But they're basically, uh, when a Chinese tourist comes to the United States, that is an American services export. When Chinese students come to the United States, uh, and go to U.S. institutions. We're getting dollars back from China. The president should be happy with that. He doesn't. He seems oblivious to it. The one other area where we're vulnerable, David, is on foreign investment. U.S. companies sell uh, far more goods and services in China through their affiliates than we export to China. It's something like three hundred and fifty billion dollars huh. of U.S. branded goods and services sold in China through majority owned affiliates in China. And th- and that sends back over $30 billion in net income profits uh, to the United States, more than U.S. companies earn in, say, Japan and uh, Canada and other major trading partners. So we're vulnerable on a number of fronts, and we're just starting to see the the damage from this trade war. Yeah, we'll come to the cost in a bit. There's been some estimates actually made of, of this trade war. I want to hold off for a little bit. And I just want to also remind our listeners of two things. One, China right now is no longer accused of currency manipulation, right? It's, it's, it's kind Correct. of a, maybe a decade ago you could say that. It's not true now. Also, there was a different way to approach China. So China does have real issues. We all acknowledge that, the ones you mentioned. And, and the most maybe safe and comprehensive approach would have been Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah, that that would have been one one approach. So yeah, just v- very very quickly, my my view on China is we have real problems. Intellectual property theft is the biggest problem. Theft is theft, uh, and that does cost U.S. companies either lost sales or royalties that they should uh, collect. But let first let's put that in a little bit of perspective. Uh, Middle income countries from India to Brazil uh, around the world have a problem enforcing intellectual property. They don't have great incentives uh, to do that necessarily. Uh, The U.S. Chamber of Commerce rates the 50 major economies in the world in terms of their treatment of intellectual property. China comes in at about the middle of the pack. In fact, they're 25th out of 50 nations. They actually have a better record on intellectual property than some of our major trading partners like uh, Brazil. Uh, China is one of the major payers to the United States in royalties for use of intellectual property. It's over $8 billion. They rank as one of the top three or four payers. That number's gone up dramatically in recent years. Uh, so uh, to, 
just to put that in perspective, and also the U.S. International uh, Trade Commission did a study of Chinese intellectual property in 2011, and they estimated U.S. companies were losing about $48 billion in sales. That's a, that's a significant number, although it comes in at about 1% of the total sales of IP-intensive companies that do business uh, in, in China. Um, so put it in perspective. And then, then the question is, what do you do about it? And I think we are better off going directly after the bad actors in China who are violating intellectual property. And we've done that. We've brought uh, sanctions. We brought cases through the Justice Department. Uh, that goes right after the bad actors, it disincentivizes them to abuse okay. the law, and it minimizes the collateral damage. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Huawei, the technology company, I, I don't know if the charges against them, uh, what weight they have, but at least uh, there we're going after the company that is allegedly responsible for the abuses rather than saying uh, uh, China's violating intellectual property rights. Therefore, tens of millions of American consumers are going to pay more the next time they go to a big box retailer. There's no connection uh, there. Uh, foreign investment in China, they do have restrictions, although there again, they've moved in a liberalizing way. The charge there, David, is that if you have a joint venture with a Chinese company, they can force the U.S. partner to transfer their technology to the Chinese partner who will eventually use that technology on their own to set up their own shop and then compete against the U.S. company. And and that happens, although our our sales in China continue to grow. I don't think we're, we're losing sales overall. And China's gotten more liberalized. The share of foreign companies that have to join joint ventures has been dropping uh, significantly. It used to be the large majority. Now it's uh, well, well below a uh, half, 70 or 80 percent of investment in China is now a wholly foreign owned and you don't have the technology transfer and they're continuing to liberalize in the automobile sector, in the financial sector. So uh, let's use the tools available. You mentioned uh, rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which sets higher American style standards in that part of the world. We should be a part of that. Um, bringing specific actions uh, through legal channels uh, we should bring more cases in the World Trade Organization. Uh, we've brought over 20 cases against China over the years. And according to a study by our friends at the Cato Institute, uh, the Chinese have moved in a market direction virtually every time. Maybe not completely, but they've taken action and moved in the right direction. We should be filing more cases in the WTO. Instead, this administration is Kind of strangling the dispute settlement mechanism in the WTO by uh, vetoing the appointment of new uh, appellate judges. So let's use all those tools available and back away. I'd like us to immediately repeal all the tariffs we've imposed against China. They're self-damaging. They haven't borne any fruit. We seem to be further away from an agreement uh, than ever. And I think it would set a more positive tone in our relations with China. Okay. Those are all great suggestions. Just real briefly, we had a guest on in a previous episode, Mike Bird from the Wall Street Journal. We talked a little bit about China's threat of dumping its treasuries, and he didn't find a very, very credible threat. What is your take on that? Yeah, David, you, I think you're more of an expert in this area than I am. But no, I don't take it as a real credible threat either. China, China owns, I think, about a, still owns about a trillion yep. dollars worth of treasure. They haven't been a big net buyer in recent years. Um, They've got a trillion dollars in assets locked up. They don't, they don't have an incentive to depreciate the value of, of those assets. They're an attractive, safe, liquid investment for them. Uh, I just don't see them uh, doing that. Okay. Well, let's move on to Mexico. And, and let's talk about this new tariff that he's imposed, 5%. And wh what do we know about the origins of this? What, what happened that caused him to do it? And it was announced via Twitter, so it wasn't like – Done the official channel. So what? What do we know? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the the president has threatened to impose a five percent duty on all imports from Mexico starting on Monday, June tenth. If if they don't uh, sort out the problems at the border, he's basically telling Mexico you need to stop the flow of illegal immigration into the United States. Most of that doesn't come from Mexico. It comes from Central America. They travel through Mexico and then uh, try to enter the U.S. 
through our border. He said uh, that's going to go up to 10% on July 1st, 15% on August 1st through to October 1st, where it'll be 25%. That seems to be the president's favorite tariff at 25%. No, this is a novel approach for handling immigration issues. Is that right? Completely novel. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Uh, And the president is, uh, you remember he declared a national emergency Uh at the border, and that was to get more funding for his wall. The president has cited uh, a a U.S. law. Let me see if I get this right. It's the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977. And that was an act by Congress that consolidated a lot of other emergency laws and tried to give more uh, definition and and really constrain the president's um, uh, range of a- activity. It's a complete abuse of that law. Um, <clears throat> that law has been used a number of times, but in virtually every case, it's been to freeze the assets of a hostile rogue regime. Think Iran. Uh, after the hostages were taken in 79 and Iraq leading up to the war and things like that. Uh, I've been told by experts that it's never been used up until now to impose tariffs. It's never been used against a friendly regime like Mexico, and it's never been used for something like uh, immigration. I think, David, I don't think it's much more complicated than the president was probably watching CNN or Fox and getting frustrated about the rising number of illegal apprehensions at the border. Uh, Of course, he can't blame his own policies. Uh, He's not getting much cooperation from Congress, so he's blaming Mexico, and he reaches for his favorite tool, uh, (laughs) the tariff, to to bring Mexico to the table to get them to do something about it. It's such a bad policy on so many levels. Uh, We're actually even finally seeing Congress uh, getting uh, aroused to protect its turf. And it's quite possible, maybe not probable, that Congress will pass a disapproval resolution that would nullify the president's tariffs and maybe even muster a veto-proof ma- majority, which they would have to do to make that go into effect. Yeah, What's really surprising is that it, it's a blunt tool for a completely different objective. I mean, you yes. can argue and debate about the best approach to China, but at least with China – you're fighting trade with trade tools, right? You're, yes. you know, tariffs because we think China's not being fair with trade. But here you're fighting an immigration issue with trade tools. Yes. It just seems to be, you know, very inconsistent. And the other thing I've heard you say and others say is that this also could backfire. If you start punishing Mexico, what that does is it could harm the economy down there, which creates an incentive for more immigrants to come into the U.S., the very thing he's trying to fight. Yes. Uh, you know, I use the word irony a lot when I talk about yeah. this administration's trade policy. And here's yet another irony. Yes, if and, – and Mexico is vulnerable. Uh, something like 80 percent of their exports go to the United States. Wow. So if we start imposing significant tariffs on it, it is, it's going to hurt us. It's also going to hurt uh, Mexico. And yes, if their factories start closing down – and unemployment rises in Mexico, uh, where are some of those workers going to look for a safety valve? They're going to want to come north to the United States where the economy is performing relatively better. Mexican migration has actually been a net negative over the last decade. More Mexicans going home because the economy has been relatively stable. There have been these relatively well-paying manufacturing jobs in Mexico, which was part of the intention of NAFTA to make the Mexican economy more healthy so that fewer Mexicans would want to immigrate to the United States uh, Ill- illegally or otherwise. So it's just yet another reason why the president's threat of tariffs against Mexico are a terrible policy option. Tell us also about the, the number of times a product might cross the border. Yes. This whole idea of global supply chain. Well, you know, in looking at the reasons why tariffs against Mexico are a bad idea, one is the the consumer impact, uh, higher prices for fruits and vegetables and consumer electronics and automobiles. Uh, But the second is, you're exactly right, the effect on integrated supply chains. What NAFTA has done, why NAFTA made so much sense on so many levels is it created an integrated North American manufacturing platform. Uh, Nowhere more important than the automobile industry. Uh, 
the U.S. has a healthy automobile industry. It's different from what it was 30, from what it was 30, 30 years ago, uh, but it's a healthier, more competitive industry. We're exporting more cars, more than 2 million vehicles exported from the United States each year. That's a record number. We've never exported that many vehicles, and it's because of this integrated supply chain. We do the higher-end stuff here. Mexico does a lot of the, the lower-end stuff or the lower value vehicles. And and to your point, David, in that integrated supply chain, I've been told that uh, automobile parts can cross the border seven or eight times in the course of production. And the zero tariffs make all the difference there, right? Because it's virtually frictionless. Well, if you impose a five or 10 or 25% duty on a part every time it enters the United States, and if supply chains are set up that that, that part's going to enter the United States and leave uh, seven or make make four round trips in the course of production, you're not talking a 25% tariff, you're talking a 100% tariff, which of course means you won't have that. And you can't just, the, the White House says, well, just make it all in the United States. Well, you can't reconfigure billions of dollars of investment in automobile factories uh, overnight. And instead of coming back to the United States, it's quite likely they'll just source them from somewhere else and pay the 2.5% tariff, the MFN tariff uh, that, that you pay on automobile and parts uh, imports to the United States. So it's going to put uh, not only higher prices for American consumers, but it's going to put uh, U.S. production and jobs immediately at risk. Yeah, so it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and even with, I think, this being made clear, the president still said he's not bluffing. But I think like Senator Cruz is one example from yes. Texas. He's very much aware of this interdependency. Yes. And he knows it would harm jobs in Texas, so he's not very happy about it. And maybe others will push back as well. But I wanted just to, to share some numbers with you and some listeners. I found a website from American University where it looks at automobile-specific makes and how much is made in Mexico, what percent, what is made yes. in Canada. And um, I also went and looked up what are the best-selling cars in the U.S., which you know, maybe that's not a good sample. Maybe you want to look at the ones that are exported too. But the top-selling you know, vehicle in the U.S. is the Ford, uh, like the F-150, 250, 350, those pickup trucks yes. of, of Ford. And 15% of them are made in Mexico. They figure 15%. Non-trivial amount, and, and then only 65% of it is made in the U.S. or Canada. Um, if you go down the list, number two was a Chevy Silverado. 44% of that is made in Mexico. 46% made in the U.S. Um, if you, I mean, at the, the highest, at the high end, this is going to an extreme. This car isn't in the top seller list, but the Ford Fiesta, 70% yeah. <laughs> of that is made in Mexico. 10% in the U.S. Yes. Um, the Chevy Equinox, 40% in Mexico, 45% in the U.S. and Canada. So this all speaks to this point. It's, it's, it's a North American manufacturing system, not a U.S. Yes. versus Mexico system. Yes, those are great numbers. And you, you notice the pattern, the kind of the higher the value of the vehicle, the big SUVs and the pickup trucks, the more value in the United States. So as you'd expect from trade, we, we've held on to the higher end uh, production the lower value, lower margin uh, vehicles, the Chevy Cruze, the Ford Fiesta, those tend to be made in Mexico. And of course, David, I don't know if those numbers include services or not, but you know, we retain the, the design, the engineering, and then of course you make money off the marketing and the dealerships and all that. So it's been great. The, the, the kind of uh, handy figure I've uh, come across is that uh, the typical import from Mexico contains about 40% U.S. value. That's across automobiles, manufacturing, and that sort of stuff. So when we slap duties on imports from Mexico, uh, we're, we're tariffing our own stuff right. as well. So we're talking about potential job losses in the United States. And what's even more remarkable about this is it's happening in the context of the administration trying to pass the USMCA or NAFTA yes. 2.0. So on one hand of the administration is like, let's get this passed. Let's push it through Congress. And the other hand is like, let's start a trade war with Mexico. And so it seems like one hand is not talking to the other. So, so tell us about what's going on with USMCA right now. Yes. Yeah, so, so the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement is the 
revision of the North American Free Trade Agreement that the Trump administrations negotiated with Canada and Mexico. And uh, David, it has pluses and minuses. Uh, the, the the pluses of USMCA, uh, you know, NAFTA was uh, negotiated 25 years ago before we had the internet and, you know, the world's changed a lot since then. So USMCA has uh, chapters on, uh, you know, enhanced uh, intellectual property protection, uh, digital trade, de minimis, which is the uh, min- minimum amount that goods can come in and not pay uh, duties. That's very important to uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and digital uh, commerce. And and a number of other features that were sort of a, a natural upgrade. I mean, one of the ironies is a lot of this was in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which included Canada and Mexico. That was a kind of NAFTA 2.0 um, but anyway, another irony uh, <laughs> nice. there. So, so there are are good things, and of course, just the uh, the uncertainty that would be taken away because the president's threatened to withdraw from NAFTA, which I think would be a huge blunder for a lot of the reasons we've talked about. Uh, on the downside, USMCA uh, has a sunset clause, which after 16 years, uh, it would have to be renewed by the party. So, yet a little bit more uncertainty. The biggest downside of USMCA is that uh, our U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer negotiated much tighter rules of origin. So if you make a vehicle uh, within NAFTA, within North America, for it to qualify for duty-free treatment, it has to have 75% of its content come from the three NAFTA countries rather than 62.5 under the old agreement. Uh, A novel provision was... 40 to 45 percent of that content has to be made by labor that earns $16 or more an hour. Uh, the typical wage in Mexico is $4 an hour. In, wow. o- in other words, no Mexicans need apply to make that uh, 40 to 45 percent. So if you tighten the rules of origin, you make it harder to qualify for duty free treatment. It's basically, it doesn't undo the benefit of the agreement, but it retreats uh, somewhat mm. and, and takes back. So USMCA. It's kind of a, a plus and minus. There have been studies of it. Uh, the USITC said it would be a net, a modest net economic positive, largely because of the uh, reduction in economic uncertainty having to do with the digital trade provisions. The IMF looked at it and and said that uh, the auto rules of origin provisions would have a, a negative effect, which would offset a lot of the positive effect. So it came to close to zero uh, effect. So those are the economics of USMCA. The politics of it, Republicans are very much for it. Democrats remain skeptical. There was momentum building for USMCA only two or three weeks ago when, as I mentioned earlier, the Trump administration uh, – eliminated the duties on steel imports from Mexico and Canada. That was a major irritant. And they had imposed retaliatory duties uh, on a lot of U.S. farm products. So you had uh, key members of Congress like the Senate Finance Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley from Iowa, who basically said, you're not going to get USMCA until you get rid of those steel tariffs so that we can have free trade in agriculture with Canada and Mexico. The administration did that. And then Two weeks later, or whatever, the president announces that he's going to impose duties against Mexico. Mexico's been a grown-up about it so far. They've tried to negotiate, but we could we could be right back to having right. retaliatory duties on uh, pork and dairy from the Midwest. And so USMCA is uh, its prospects were always going to be challenging, but I think uh, the chances of it getting past this summer. Uh, really a key date before the August recess. And then, believe it or not, the presidential politics sort of kicks in after that. That window is closing rapidly, and the president's tariffs against Mexico are maybe are going to shut that window entirely. So if we don't get the USMCA, does NAFTA continue to operate? Yet, yes, it does. And that's there should be no confusion about it. Uh, NAFTA is the status quo. Okay. The president could turn around and say, well, if you're not going to pass USMCA, we're going to get rid of NAFTA. I think there would be tremendous pressure on the president not to do that from the business community, from Congress. But with this president, who who knows? <laughs>
Well, the good news, I guess, then, is he, we're not blowing up NAFTA. It's just that the, the new version of NAFTA may not pass. So we still have the integrated markets co- and all that. Correct. And I, uh, you know, there's things that need to be modernized from NAFTA. Sure. But NAFTA as it is, I will defend for the rest of the day <laughs> okay. that NAFTA was a good thing and has served our country well. Yeah. And one of the key themes I hear you saying is just the uncertainty. It, you know, it's one thing if you want to have a conversation about whether a country's being fair or not, but you want to do it in a predictable, systematic way. You want yes. when businesses make long term big investments, billions of dollars in factory plants, yes. and on a whim the president says yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, no, and does it on Twitter, it's hard to plan, it's hard to spend money, and therefore there's fewer jobs, fewer wealth creation. So um that is, that's troubling, I guess, the uncertainty that's been created. You're, you're exactly right. I mean, tariffs have a quantifiable negative impact on the economy, but uncertainty also has an, an impact. We, we published a study a couple of years ago by uh, uh, Professor Bob Kroll from the University of California, which uh, showed that uncertainty reduces trade and reduces uh, e- economic activity. But here we have a president who not only likes tariffs, but, you know, it's part of his operating method to create a lot of uncertainty and then use that in in his art of the deal to get people to the table and then come to a better deal. But, of course, that uncertainty has a real business cost. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the economic impact of all the tariffs since 2018. Yes. What do we know? Any studies have been done that have estimated what the costs are, who's bearing the costs? Yeah, glad, glad you asked that. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, and as we discussed, the trade war really kicked off, and it is a trade war, I think, by any definition. It really kicked off in January of 2018. So 2018, we had kind of a real-world experiment. We've had post-war decades of declining trade barriers, and I'd argue that served our nation well. 2018, we took a significant turn back. It it just so happens the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research uh, economists and economists from the New York Fed uh, did a comprehensive study that was published by NBER uh, a month or two ago looking at the president's tariff wars in 2018 and attempting to quantify using general equilibrium models the effect of those tariffs. And David, just to give you a scope, uh, when that study was published, uh, they – counted $283 billion in imports to the United States that had come under tariffs ranging from 10 to 50 percent because of the president's tariff actions on appliances, steel, imports from China. The retaliation, and that covered about 12 percent of U.S. uh, imports. The retaliation uh, covered $121 billion of U.S. exports. That's about 16 percent of our uh, exports. Uh, and the study came to a couple of, I think, headline kind of conclusions. Uh, one, uh, they determined that the cost of the imports that the U, uh, the tariffs that the U.S. had imposed on imports, that cost fell almost entirely on U.S. consumers. Yes, it hurt Chinese companies and lost sales and that. But the cost increases got passed on almost entirely to the United States. Just a little quote from the study. Close to all of the cost of the 2018 U.S. tariffs has been borne so far by U.S. consumers and importers. Who's paying those billions of dollars in tariff that the president brags that he's bringing into the Treasury? It's you and me and tens of millions of of Americans going about their business every day. The other determination, David, was uh, it has a net negative effect on the U.S. It's forced supply chains to be uh, reconfigured. It's it's forced us to move to less efficient ways of producing things. They calculate the monthly the monthly cost is about one point four billion dollars. That's roughly the cost of of one of these bomb cyclones that has hit uh, the the Midwest. Huh. So our own government is sending a bomb cyclone <laughs> to the heartland. Uh, once a month based on the president's tariff war. Those numbers uh, uh, fell a little bit when the president uh, lifted the tariffs against Canadian and Mexican uh, steel, uh, but they're prepared to go, they're, they're ready to go up if he follows through on his action against Mexico. Those are remarkable numbers. I've heard someone else say that this is a, effectively a tax 
hike on consumers, a, a large one. And if you were to go through with the Mexico yes. tariffs, if you were to do the additional 25% on the remaining $300 billion, this would be one of the largest tax hikes that U.S. citizens have seen in a long time. Yes. Uh, there's been there's been some analysis uh, comparing it to the, the tax cuts of the 2017 bill and saying that the president's actually taking back a big share of it. Uh, so uh, I did a little analysis on my, my blog site uh, a few weeks ago when a trade report came out. So far, the president's tariffs over the last 12 months have raised about $20 billion in additional tariff revenue. We were raising a pretty steady 30 to $32 billion a year in tariff revenue over the last 12 months, it's 54 billion. So an extra 22 billion. If, if these, all these tariffs on China kick in, if the tariffs on Mexico kick in and they stay in place over a sustained period, we could be talking a hundred billion dollars in additional federal revenue. To put that in perspective, the federal government collects 3.5 trillion dollars a year. So, so far it's been less than 1% of revenue. Uh, federal spending last year went up $300 billion, so it isn't even keeping up. It isn't reducing the deficit. And then the final thing I'll say about tariff revenue, besides the damage it does to the economy, David, that is one of the most regressive taxes that the U.S. government imposes. American consumers pay those tariffs, but low-income households pay a higher percentage of that. Why? Because they spend a higher share of their income on consumption, and these are basically consumption taxes aimed at imports. And poor households spend a higher share of their income on the more tradable goods that are subject to tariffs, right? Food, clothing, footwear. Think, you know, the China tariffs so far have been weighted towards more industrial supplies. Uh, but if the president follows through and tariffs the other 300 billion or so of what we buy from China, that's going to go directly at consumer products. Who's going to pay that? Think of the typical American family walking into a big box retailer. Their prices are going to go up. Walmart and others have said they'll have no choice but to raise prices. And, and, and those tend to be more Trump voters. That's how many times have I used the word irony in our discussion? Right. It's another irony of the president's uh, tariff policies that uh, they are striking hardest at Trump voters and red state America. So the coastal elites will miss much of this, but people who shop at Walmart will bear the brunt of it. That is very ironic. I want to give another example of some of the costs that may be borne by this. This is an example. It's, it's anecdotal, so it's not like systematic evidence, but it's a story in the New York Times about a bike shop. And this this bike shop, they sell four to five hundred bright orange two wheelers a year. And what they have found, what what they they design it as you mentioned, they do the design, they 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 get the customers, they market it, but then they send the production over to China. And what they they found is that they're increasingly more expensive to get the bikes out of China, and it's it's harming their business. There was a yes. small boutique bike store yes. um, in wa Washington, the state of Washington. And so this little business is is having a hard time making ends meet, having to potentially lay people off. So small businesses are being harmed as well when it comes to this trade war. Yes, and you see those kind of stories in the news media day day after day. It isn't just Fortune 500 companies. It's small American uh, producers and retailers that are paying these higher prices. That that bike shop story is a is a great example and and the owners of the bike shop are, are well, first off, it shows that the prices do get passed through to the ultimate importer here in the United States. Then they face a choice. Do they pass the cost on to their uh, customers and maybe lose sales? Do they have to eat it in terms of less return on their capital? It's just hurting Americans uh, across the board. All right. Well, the time we have left, I, I want to maybe kind of circle around and, and, and think about what this means in terms of understanding Trump's view of trade and tariffs, you know, we could have had this conversation a year ago and best case scenario argued that Trump was doing this because he really did care about trade. Yes. He's using it to make trade freer or fairer. But can we reach that same conclusion now? Yeah, I think that is harder and harder to argue that the president has some grand 
strategy uh, that he's employing to get us to free trade, get people to the table so we can get tariffs down. You know, once a year or so, the president will say, we need to have zero tariffs and, and free investment and all that. And between those pronouncements, there's a hundred tweets where he says uh, tariffs are good. Remember, he said uh, trade wars are good and easy to win. Easy to win. Yes. Um, he says that tariffs are are building a stronger economy. The president likes tariffs. Um, he his thinking is rooted. I wouldn't even say in the 1930s. It's rooted in the the 1600s, uh, pre Adam Smith, where trade is a zero sum game. And we only win by making the other country lose. And the scorecard is the trade balance. Uh, That's just a fundamental misunderstanding. Uh, It doesn't appreciate the value of imports. He doesn't understand that we also trade in services. We also trade in assets. So the U.S. trade deficit overall is offset by a, a surplus in investment income, the Chinese buying treasury bonds, Japanese building and, and the Germans building automobile plants, uh, here in in the United States. So, you know, David, I think the silver lining of the president's trade policies is it has given us a fascinating real world experiment. And I think what our, us economist types have been saying over the years have, have proven to be largely true. Trade is a win-win. Trade wars are a, a, a lose-lose. And we're seeing it every day uh, in, in, in the business pages. Yeah, it's hard to argue he's not a protectionist at his core. That it, you know, his heart beats protectionism, based on everything we've seen, as opposed yes. to he really wants to be free trade. Just has his way of doing it. Um, and you know, there's been a lot written about this that he he may have cut his teeth in this thinking based on his real estate deals. Yes. I mean, we've talked about this on hallway conversations that maybe the way he views the world is, you know, my gain is your loss, or yes. your gain is my loss. There is no. You know, for him, the pie is fixed. If he gets a bigger slice, I get a smaller slice, vice versa. As opposed to, we would say trade makes that pie grow bigger. Yes. And, you know, I think one of the important tasks of economists is to just to make that point. We call that comparative advantage. You know, you specialize in what you do best and everyone's better off. You know, it, it's, we have it everywhere in our lives, right? At home, I can mow our, we have a couple acres, has to be mowed a lot during the summertime. And I can do a much better job than my kids can do. But it takes a long time to do it, right? Yes. And I let them do that, and I can focus on my work, which you know earns us money. I mean, the world, yes. the, the home is a much better place when we labor specialized. And that's everywhere, at work, you know, uh, between countries, between firms. It's a very basic principle. David Ricardo, you mentioned, you know, that period when he's, he's from. It's just something that hasn't been communicated effectively to many people, including our president. Yeah, I, I agree, David. You know, trade is mutually beneficial. That's why trade occurs. It's it's millions of mutually beneficial transactions. And the president just doesn't grasp that on a very basic level. I mean, in the president's mind, when, when we buy an import from China, that's China stealing money uh, from us. It's as though you come out of the grocery store with your cart bulging with goods and you grumble that the grocery store just stole $150 and doesn't buy anything from you. Well, no, you got these great, great products <laughs> right. and the money circulates uh, around and, and comes back. So, you know, it's a, it's a teachable moment. I think we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves, David, as a, as a kind of economic education profession. The polls show Gallup has asked attitudes towards trade over the years, and support for trades at something of a, a relative high. I think, I think a majority of our fellow Americans grasp at an intuitive level, if not down to a theoretical level, that that trade is good. It's good that we can bring in fresh fruit and vegetables uh, from Mexico and have more competition in what kind of cars we buy, and be able to buy uh, shirts for $10 or $5 from Bangladesh or wherever and use that money to take our spouse out to eat uh, that, that night. So trade is good. That, that, and, and finally, isn't this a lesson that ideas have consequences? The president, unfortunately, has some bad ideas that he's had for 30 years. This is an area where he's been consistent. If you look at Donald Trump's clips talking about trade 30 years ago, the target then was Japan, but it's eerily similar. Japan's taking advantage of us. We have a trade deficit. Uh, 
they're ripping us off. We need to have a 20% tariff. Now, it, now it's just China. Uh, but bad ideas have bad consequences. And unfortunately, we're seeing that working itself out right now. Yeah. So it will be interesting to see what happens in this next presidential election. So, I mean, he's already set the stage for a more protectionist, inward-looking approach to the world. And and the the thing that also concerns many is just not what's happening now, but what's happening in the future. All these institutions, global supply chains, um, institutions like the WTO you mentioned, things that are breaking down because of what we're doing today. And then on top of that, we have this presidential election, and it'll be President Trump running against you know a number of Democratic candidates who, on many of these issues, may agree with him and willing to push yes. the envelope even farther. So I, I, I worry that we're we may be pushing more and more away, even though you say most Americans do support trade, as the polls indicate. My concern is we're getting awfully close to a precipice where maybe there'll be some real and lasting damage to global trade. Yeah, I, I agree with you, David. It's a it's a pivotal moment for the Republican Party. Is is President Trump going to redefine them as a populist party, a nativist party that is skeptical of trade and and hostile to immigration? That's a big question. And then for our our friends uh, among the Democrats, are they going to, uh, in effect, uh, mirror what Trump has done and and try to double down on it? Bernie Sanders is as much a protectionist as as the president. Or are they going to sound a more centrist, traditional, bipartisan approach on trade, which Joe Biden has is uh, uh, sounded like he's going to do? So you that's, know, that's true. So there are there are different types of Democrats. I shouldn't put them all. Correct. There's one. divisions within yeah. within both both parties. There's a core of 25 or 30 Democrats in the House that consistently vote uh, for for trade. I almost hate to admit this in my line of work, but trade is typically not a pivotal issue. In presidential politics, it gets talked about, uh, but I think the issues in 2020 are going to be uh, different than trade. But it's still going to be telling which which direction the two parties go as they duke it out. We know where the president stands. Uh, is the Democratic nominee going to stake out a more trade friendly position or try to outdo the president in terms of protectionism? Well, just one example. So Senator Elizabeth Warren just recently announced a new, you know, very ambitious economic program as part of her platform running for, for president. One of the items on that list was to manage our currency in a way to offset yes. currency manipulations elsewhere in the world. So that's a very much a trade focused concern. And I know she's invoking what, you know, it advocates say very systematic rules based approach, but it's still, it's, it, it's a, it's a step in that direction towards more intervention in, in yes. our currency and trade, which to me is, again, it's, it's a symptom that we're moving maybe on the margin a little bit away from where we've been with free trade. And, and I want to be, you know, to, we've been very gung ho about trade on the show. I, I acknowledge all the concerns. Globalization has been really rapid. There's been a lot of losers as well as winners, and maybe we need to, we do need to do more about those folks. But it, it is concerning that we're moving, I think, incrementally away from what we had. Yeah, it it is concerning, and that the dynamics in both parties, their bases tend to be pulling the candidates in a more populist, interventionist direction, and that should worry us in a broad front, but uh, including on trade policy. Okay. With that, our time is up. Our guest has been Dan Griswell. Dan, thank you for coming back on the show. Glad to be here, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.